Well, thank you, Aaron, and thank you to the NOLA Library for hosting this webinar and this webinar series. Um, I'm John McLaughlin from NOAA's Office of Education. I'm Laura Ormland from NOAA Fisheries, and we are co-coordinators for NOAA Citizen Science. And we'd like to thank our co-presenters who will be presenting remotely today on their outstanding citizen science efforts. We'll hear from Chris Bratt Bowser, Amy Fritz, Jennifer Jenks, and Gil Campo. And today we'll be talking about citizen science. Just a quick show of hands in the room. How many of you have heard of citizen science before? And how many of you have done citizen science? All right, great. We'll hopefully get a few more hands at the end of this talk. Um, so I'd like to start off with an outline of what we'll be doing today. We'll be defining citizen science, what we mean. We'll be overviewing efforts here within our agency and how you can get involved. And then we'll learn about four example projects that I mentioned previously. And then we'll be discussing the ever important data quality considerations. And finally, we'll have time for question and answers. So the definition, a lot of text up here. This is the official definition for citizen science for the federal government. It's a form of open collaboration in which individuals, organizations participate voluntarily in the scientific process, including, and there's a long list of ways they can become involved in the scientific process. The key thing I want you to take away here is that it's more than just collecting data. People often have preconceived notion that citizen scientists collect environmental data, which they do, and that's important, but they can do so much more than just collect data. They can help uh, formulate research questions, interpret data, uh, make discoveries. So um, please keep that in mind when you, when you think about citizen science. And a couple clarifications. We're going with the term citizen science today. Uh, the same type of work is known by other names, including here within NOAA. Increasingly, you'll hear it called community science. Um, it's traditionally I've been called volunteer monitoring, as well as public participation in scientific research. Um, and it can be a form of what's known as crowdsourcing, which is going out to the crowd to help you solve a problem, often through online means. And this is not new at all, um, but it's evolving rapidly. This first photo here is a group called the Champlain Society, which formed in 1880. And it was a, a group of undergraduate students who then involved local community members who wanted to take measurements at Mount Desert Island in Maine. And they continued for, this club continued for decades and identified over a thousand distinct plant species and over 200 species of birds. Um, they detailed the unique geological features of this area and their work ultimately led to the formation of Acadia National Park. So any of you who've enjoyed Acadia National Park, the Champagne Society is uh, part of the formation. Around the same time, this group was collecting measurements on Mount Desert Island, NOAA's uh, one of NOAA's citizen science programs was just starting. Our Cooperative Observer Network, which you'll hear more about, um, had a network of volunteers taking diligent measurements at weather stations to help document the weather and climate of our nation. These hands-on traditional data are still extremely valuable. Acadia National Park uses some of this historical data uh, for baselines and management. The Co-op Observer Network, as you'll hear, their, their data uh, current and historical is, is extremely valuable. Um, but there are now many different ways citizen science can participate. Most people now carry around an incredibly powerful tool for data collection in their pockets in terms of cell phones. Um, apps such as the MPing app from NOAA allow you to report whether or not you're seeing precipitation near instantly. So in about a second, you can give a report. These reports can be accompanied by photos, directions, accelerometer data, um, we have a, even a project at NOAA that uses magnetometer data um, from phones to try to track uh, met the magnetic fields of Earth. There's also growth in low-cost sensors that pair with phones. So what phones can be able to collect and do is only increasing with time. There's also recently been a growth in online projects where people don't go out and collect hands-on measurements. Rather, they help analyze data sets or imagery um, from the comfort of their own home. And you'll hear about an example project Stellar Watch uh, later in this talk. Um, and there are blended models where some people are out in the field collecting data with their phones, and then a community of experts, volunteer experts, work remotely from their computers to verify those measurements of 
app called iNaturalist is a model of this, where people identify flora and fauna from their phones, and then um, a community of volunteer experts have to approve those observations before they go into the database. I'll jump in here for a minute. So we've covered, NOAA has a diversity of topics and scales that our citizen science efforts apply to. As you can see by the diversity of pictures here, it could be applying to our cooperative shark tagging program, which has been around since the 1960s. Uh, could be applying is the, to geomag using the compass in your phones for geomagnetic models or collecting data points to support those models. Uh, weather, marine mammals, cyclones, even mapping the seafloor. It's a diversity of topics and scales. As you're going to hear later from our Hudson River Eel project, it might just be in a simple, you know, in the single state or single area, single river. But we also have, in terms of that geomagnetic field um, project, people could be collecting data all over the world. So it could be local, it could be global. So it's a wide range. And we talked about how emerging technologies are expanding what volunteers can do in citizen science. It's also lowering the bar for creating a project. Um, it used to be you'd have to create data entry mechanisms, ways to get volunteers to talk to each other, sometimes phone lines, mailing paper forms. Now you can create an app quite quickly. And this has led to an extreme growth in the use of citizen science. This plot is uh, scientific publications from the web of science that use the keyword citizen science from 1995, 2015. And you see this rapid period of growth about 10 years ago. And this period of growth and this extreme growth is still continuing um, in metrics we're tracking today. So this field is growing rapidly, which is why we're really working to highlight it here within our agency as an option to engage people. And why it all matters. Well, citizen science can have multiple impacts. It can enhance scientific research and monitoring. When applied intentionally, it can provide hands-on learning and increase STEM literacy for its participants. And it can help address societal needs. It can help communities collect the data or information they need and answer questions they have. For a while, it was thought that a project had to kind of choose and narrow in on one of these. So a project would say, oh, I'm an educational project, so I'm collecting citizen science data for educational purposes, or I'm a research project. Um, but we're learning more and more these uh, outcomes are complementary. And a 2018 report from the National Academy actually details this. So if you're increasing the uh, STEM content knowledge of your participants in your project, that may well lead to greater scientific research coming out of your project and vice versa. If you're uh, coming up with unique scientific findings and sharing with those, those with your volunteers, you may end up doing a better job of increasing their STEM literacy. Previous to 2013, there was a lot of citizen science going on within our agency, but there was uh, no coordination group. So in 2013, we started a community of practice here for NOAA staff who are working or interested in citizen science. It's grown to over 220 members. And shortly after we started our NOAA community, a federal community of practice uh, came into creation um, that involves now over 60 agencies and 400 uh, members of uh, the federal workforce. And we'll talk about the website, citizenscience.gov. And then 2015, a fieldwide citizen science association started and has grown rapidly. And recently we've been seeing uh, kind of intra-agency, intra-line office efforts here with NOAA. Sea Grant is having, has a uh, community and is having their second workshop in May. And Sanctuaries uh, has a website and tracks citizen science metrics and they tracked over 10, almost 11,000 uh, volunteers participating in projects they offered in 2019. So how do you engage in these communities? Well, if you're NOAA staff, um, by NOAA staff, I mean contractor, federal employee, members of our associated networks like Sea Grant, NEARS. Um, email Laura and I, and we'll sign you up to join our community, which shares resources and best practices. And we'll be having its first in person workshop this April here in Silver Spring. Um, CitizenScience.gov, the website for our federal community, offers a toolkit on how to uh, create and run a project, and it has a catalog of projects. Um, it has 450 projects in the catalog, over 50 of which are supported by us here at NOAA. The Citizen Science Association, which I mentioned, their website is citizenscience.org instead of .gov. Um, they have biannual conferences and offer a, a free journal. And um, their last conference had over 800 participants, so it really has been showing the growth in the field. If you're interested in volunteering in a project, NOAA has a volunteer opportunities page. The URL is here, but you can find it off 
noaa.gov. Just go to about our agency, and then there's a volunteer with NOAA link right there. So I'm going to turn things over to Laura. Okay, thanks. Thanks, John. So as John mentioned, we've seen the curve of exponentially growing publications. And also in the last few years, we've just seen an increasing amount of emphasis on citizen science. In 2016, that citizenscience.gov website came out, so the federal hub for citizen science. In 2017, the Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Act was also enacted. Um, following the next year, 2018, our science, NOAA Science Advisory Board took a deep dive into citizen science, and one of the recommendations or findings was that it was an underutilized tool towards our ecosystem science efforts. So we're currently addressing those recommendations. Um, John mentioned the National Academy of Sciences report, which came out in 2018. And finally, in 2019, the White House released a report to Congress, which I'll get into shortly. So a little bit about this act. Uh, the Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Act was enacted in 2017. It provides a formal definition for citizen science and crowdsourcing, which John actually covered at the beginning. It does provide a formal authority under which you can use to conduct citizen science at a federal science, ag science agency, but it doesn't provide a mandate to do it, just guidance on how to do it if you choose to, choose to use this mandate. It offers guidance on how to conduct the projects as well as criteria for accepting voluntary services. And it also requires a, a biennial report, which I'm gonna to get to. So um, what was exciting as we got to the release of this report in June was that the director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy was on hand specifically to release it. And in his remarks, he mentioned the Trump administration's commitment to unleash federal resources, strengthen partnerships inside and outside of government, and encourage citizens to tackle great scientific challenges. So it was exciting to see such support at a high level for citizen science. Now a little bit about what the report covered. It covered 2017 to 2018, time period since the act had come out. The act highlighted 86 citizen science and crowdsourcing activities across federal agencies, with actually 14 of them, and 11 of those, or 13%, came from NOAA. It also described prize competitions. You may have heard of things like hackathons and such. So it does cover those that information as well over the 2017-18 time period. And now we're gonna move on to our exciting part, which is projects in action. So you can hear from the project leads themselves. Uh, you're gonna hear about our cooperative observer program, old weather, crowdsource bathymetry, as well as the Hudson River Eel Project. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Amy Fritz from our cooperative observer program. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, we hear you great, Amy. Wonderful, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so a little bit about the co-op program as it's called in short, the Cooperative Observer Network. Um, they are a group of volunteer citizens who've been essentially collecting meteorological data since the 1890s and even earlier, but it was really formalized with the Organic Act of 1890. And they've been collecting maximum and minimum temperature and daily precipitation, not just rain, but also snowfall, snowmelt, snow water equivalent, et cetera, and other interesting phenomena as our needs are requiring. In addition to what they collect, they also support our forecast watches and warnings at the National Weather Service. So for instance, if they see a funnel cloud or no wind damage, those kind of things, which really help verify our forecasts and help us put out better watches and warnings. So a little bit more about the network. We have over 8,100 active sites and of that over 10,000 volunteers. Now real big numbers are here. 2,000 of those sites have been in operation for over a hundred years. You want to talk about a lot of dedication. These volunteers are absolutely amazing. They continue to collect our observations, which ultimately have made up our U.S. climate record. And for people out there who are wondering if you've ever heard of something from the co-op program, anytime they say on the news a record was broken, as in a snowfall record or temperature record or something to that nature, chances are they know that because of this network and the observations these volunteers have brought into us. So next slide, please. A little bit about our equipment, seeing that it goes back to the 1890s, it's not modern, 
that's one of the things that I hope to do with the program is help bring things up to modern date. But you'll see in the first picture is our cotton region shelter. Inside that are two liquid glass thermometers, one for measuring the maximum temperature and one for the minimum. The upper right corner is myself and my wonderful assistant, Tom Trunk. And we are standing in front of a standard rain gauge, which is an eight inch rain gauge, which collects water. And how you measure it is by dropping a special ruler down into it and noting the wet spot on the bottom. Yes, really basic technology here. Also in the lower left-hand corner is a more modern collecting type rain gauge, which is also used in the Coco Ross network. In the middle lower, you'll see our MMTS, which is our max min thermometer system, along with a fish reporter rain gauge, which is a gauge that weighs the rain as it's collected and then records it on an hourly basis. Unfortunately, we have to use very old technology, if I can say, to um, download that data. It was once originally collected on punch tape, and they've since modernized it to use downloading by USB drives and SD cards, but we're working on modernizing that as well. And then lastly, in the bottom six, something you may not recognize that's actually an evaporation pan because part of our now also measures evaporation as it's so important to agriculture and other uses next slide please next slide please so i can tell you numbers but sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words this is just a snapshot of what the network looks like from the globe and unfortunately unless i could spin that globe you can't even see the full network because we go as far as north as Barrow, Alaska, and all the way out to islands like Guam. Pretty much every U.S. territory is covered and all the way over to Puerto Rico. So I thought I would put this picture up there just so you can kind of get a, an idea of how vast the network is and how much coverage we have. Next slide, please. So one of the common questions I get is, wow, Amy, how do I get a hold of the data? Is it available daily? Can I get the monthly reports? How do I go about doing that? And I'm happy to say, yes, you can. It's very easy. Our partners over at the National Center for Environmental Information underneath NESDAS, they were formerly known as the National Climate Data Center, if you've ever heard of NCDC, that's them. They have a bunch of products that use our data. One of them that's very popular is their Global Historical Climate Network Daily Product. And that's what you see in the picture over there. And that's just an idea of what minimum temperature looked like as we started off this new decade. If you wanna know about particular stations, how long they've been around, the metadata is also very helpful and they have that on what's called their Homer site. That's the Historical Observing Metadata Repository and I'm including the links on these slides and I hope they'll be made available to people afterward because it's a lot of fun to look around at some of this. Also, if you wanna look back at some historical records, maybe you're doing a research project and you wanna know about some of the temperatures or precipitation that was collected over time, you can go back and actually find the original paper forms at NCEI in their images and publication system. And yes, they go back quite a ways. So go ahead and click to the next slide. I'll show you an example of this. Next slide, there it is. So this is one of the original paper records. This one happens to be out of Ellensburg, Washington in Kittitas County and it's from May 1980. And I bring this up because our volunteers have collected more than just precip and maximum temperature. I don't know how well you know your history, but going back to May 1980, there was a very significant event. And if you can squint your eyes and look very carefully around about May 19th, you'll notice comments related to ash. Now, I wish I could just ask the question and hear people's responses, but if you think back to what was taking place at that time, it was Mount St. Helens erupting. So we are about to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Mount St. Helens eruption. And here, observed in the Cooperative Observer Program, our comments of ash. Go ahead onto the next slide or click so I can get the next animation. Here's another record of it from Yakima, Washington, also closely, closely uh, within proximity of the volcanic eruption. And it too notes ash in it. And I just thought I would share these, especially since we're coming up on an anniversary for the National Weather Service and for the volcanic eruption. And since we're looking at one of our speakers here will be talking about historical weather, I thought this would be of interest. So that is all I have for today. Thank you very much for giving me a chance to speak to everyone on the co-op program. Thanks, Amy. We're gonna move on to our old weather program. So we're gonna tran transition over to our speaker, Gil Campo, momentarily.
Hi, this is Gil Campo at the University of Colorado Ceres and NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory Physical Sciences Division. Thank you for having me to speak about the Old Weather Project on behalf of more than 20,000 contributors uh, in the Old Weather team and also our uh, co-leads, Kevin Wood, Philip Brohan, and our colleagues here in Boulder, Kathy Smith and Laura Slavinsky, who have contributed to this presentation. So nearly everything we know about the world ocean before the satellite era can be linked to a single document type, the ship's logbook. The logbook is a codex, a bound manuscript. It is a one-of-a-kind artifact among thousands and thousands of others that are equally unique. None of them are machine readable yet. Here's an example of 24 weather observations out of more than 300,000 weather observations recorded by the officers of this one ship. And there are thousands of ships that have been traversing the seas since the 17th century, and in particular recording with pretty standard methods since the 1850s. Our old weather citizen scientists from all over the world have transcribed millions of these logbook records, and there are millions more to do. With the logbook records that have already been transcribed, we can use them in NOAA products, such as the uh, extended reconstructed sea surface temperatures or NOAA global temp produced by the National Centers for Environmental Information. And I'd like to tell you about how we use them here at the Physical Sciences Division in the 20th century reanalysis. We combine those observations of the weather, in particular pressure, with all other observations of pressure from stations and other ships at the same time to make a three-dimensional reconstruction of the weather every three hours, now back to 1806. And what I'm showing you here is an animation. I've lost my, there we go. I've lost my control. Uh, I'm showing you, I would be showing you an animation, but it's not working, it worked earlier. There we go. So this is uh, October 1880, and we're gonna see the historic low pressure uh, in sea level in the North Pacific. And you'll also see what is an atmospheric river forming. All this was done from the ship logbook data and station data. And those logbooks, many of them have come from the old weather project. And we only half jokingly say that with reanalysis, we can turn these old logbooks into what is nearly remote sensing. In fact, if you look at a modern uh, satellite image, it'll look a lot like this when you're having an atmospheric river. And we can compare modern storms. This record was just broken uh, in the last few years. So anyone can participate in old weather. There are several different sub-projects. Uh, old weather Arctic for ships that have been in the Arctic at some point. Old weather whaling, where we're getting a lot of really good sea ice data because the whaling vessels were near the uh, sea ice edge. We have a new development site where the volunteers are helping to train optical character recognition or machine learning to improve this situation where we can read the logbooks with machines because there are many more images than we have transcribers, even though we've had 20,000 people or more participate. I'd also like to recognize our sister projects, Southern Weather Discovery, Weather Rescue and Data Rescue Archival and Weather that are also ongoing, recovering the weather history of our planet and to put our uncontrolled experiment with greenhouse gases in historical context. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the many officers whose daily work it was to record these observations. These are officers of the Revenue Cutter Manning. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we're going to transition back over to crowdsource bathymetry with Jennifer Jenks. Uh, Jennifer, can you hear us? Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, we can. Thanks, Jennifer. Wonderful. Okay. Wonderful. Great. Okay, so as Amy said, my name is Jennifer Jenks, and I serve as the director of the International Hydrographic Organization Data Center for Digital Bathymetry. 
which we have hosted here at the National Centers for Environmental Information in Boulder, Colorado for the last 30 years. Um, for my five minute slot, I'm going to highlight an ongoing effort that's meant to encourage all types of mariners to help us map the gaps. Next slide. Next slide. There we go. Okay, now by gaps, I'm referring to the extraordinary lack of data coverage that we have of our ocean floors. And contrary to the pretty blue maps that we're all used to seeing, such as the one in the previous slide, what's actually been mapped is shown here in rainbow colors. We're talking less than 18% of our deep ocean floor that's been mapped with direct measurement. And our coastal waters are only slightly better at around 50% data coverage. Now with buzzwords like blue economy and efforts like the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development picking up momentum, a baseline data set that includes a mapped ocean floor is a necessity. Next slide. And to do this, we'll require an incredible national and international coordinated effort. Next slide. Now in 2014, the IHO recognized that traditional survey vessels alone weren't going to bring these numbers to 100. We were going to need everyone's help. And so they initiated a collaborative project to enable mariners to collect crowdsource bathymetry. They've defined CSB as the collection of depth measurements from vessels using their standard navigation instruments while engaged in their routine maritime operations. Here at the DCDB, with funding by NOS's Office of Coast Survey, we are supporting this effort by standing up and hosting a new data pipeline, which allows the public to upload, discover, and download CSB via a web-based map viewer interface. And the URL to that map viewer is right there. Next slide. Now, like most citizen science initiatives, part of the value of this data is that it comes at no cost to the public sector. This matters because surveying the seafloor is incredibly expensive. And this data, though certainly nowhere near the quality or accuracy of professionally collected data, would still be able to fill gaps where data may be scarce, such as the Arctic or around small island developing states. It's also incredibly useful along coastlines, especially ever-changing coastlines, where survey vessels may not visit often, if ever, but you might have a fisherman who frequents daily. And of course, while the data may or may not find its way onto a nautical chart, it can certainly aid in identifying uncharted features and in assisting in verifying charted information. Next slide. So how does this work? Well, the reality is we can't actually have hundreds and eventually thousands of individual mariners hitting NOAA servers with their data. I've had the conversations and I can tell you IT would not like that. So what we've been doing is working with a variety of what we refer to as trusted nodes, or companies, universities, organizations that can serve as trusted data aggregators. I have two examples shown here. One is Rose Point Navigation System. They're the ones that really kicked this off. They have allowed their customers to turn on their electronic charting system log file to record their position, depth, and time. And so whenever this mariner updates their software or their chart catalog, their log data is automatically sent to Rosepoint, who in turn automatically transmit it, transmits it to us. We receive this data every morning. James Cook University recently purchased and distributed inexpensive data loggers, around $100 a pop, to almost 100 volunteer recreational boats that are using their own echo sounder and their own GPS sensors while sailing along the Great Barrier Reef, an area where less than 40% um, of depth data is found. We're currently working with them to test a data transfer pipeline. Next slide. Now the major hurdle of this initiative is a legal one. There are several IHO member countries who just flat out will not allow the collection of CSB in their exclusive economic zones. And they have requested that we filter incoming data to reflect those positions. We're working on that right now. And then there are many countries that are simply on the fence and they haven't officially given the IHO their position. So in the meantime, we have to assume that they are a no country and not show data within their waters as well. Next slide. So our focus right now, along with beefing up our uh, infrastructure is to continue to talk to these countries every chance we get. 
about the value of these data, trying to sort of calm their nerves about liability and legal issues, and hope that they officially become a yes country. We're also working to bring on board new trusted nodes like Carnival Cruise Line and the Voluntary Observing Ships Program. And on the infrastructure front, we're hoping to implement point storage or cloud technology to better handle and store the growing data volumes as a seamless collection of points, which will better serve our community. And as a colleague, Tim Thornton once said, if we could get 1% of all seagoing vessels to log data, and on average, they spend half their time at sea, then that's about 5 billion data points a day. And so if Tim is anywhere near right, then crowdsource bathymetry stands to become a significant contributor in our efforts to map the gap. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And we're gonna move on to our final panelist today, uh, Chris Bowser, who's gonna talk to us about the Hudson River Eel Project. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Bowser is unmuted. I love it. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for, for having me here. This is a bit of a different project. Um, a lot of the projects that we've uh, seen today have national or even global significance. This project, at least right now, is very focused on the Hudson River in New York. However, it is absolutely applicable uh, to any waterway from the Gulf of Mexico to the Canadian Maritimes along uh, North America's East Coast, and then globally, many different places could have this. Um, this focuses on a weird, strange creature called the American eel. And if you don't know eels, spend some time on Wikipedia and go down a rabbit hole. You won't regret it. Next slide. First of all, one of the amazing things about eels is they have this tremendous multi-thousand mile migration in their lives. Every single American eel along the East Coast was born in the Sargasso Sea, roughly between Bermuda and Puerto Rico. They drift to coastal estuaries as larvae in the first year of their life. They swim from salt water up into brackish water estuaries, up into watersheds. They'll live and mature and grow, and sometimes for decades before at the end of a 20 or 30 year life, they find their way back to the Sargasso Sea to spawn once, lay up to 20 million eggs and die, but not before a next generation is made. It is an evolutionary miracle. Next slide. And the part of the eel that we're most interested in is this little guy, the glass eel. Now, uh, these are the juvenile eels that are coming in, at least in uh, on the east coast of North America, every spring. That's right, they're on their way right now. And they are highly prized around the world. Uh, eels are a delicacy in many, many countries. Um, and in fact, some glass eels are harvested in the state of Maine and a few in South Carolina for use in international uh, culinary arts all over the place. So there's a, there's a really strong economic driver for this. But the bad news is, like many of our migratory fish, their numbers are a little bit shaky. The Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission says this is a depleted resource. We do not have as many eels as we used to. Knowing how many eels we have is a really important piece of science. And that's where the Hudson River Eel Project comes in. We're able to monitor every spring how many of these little, beautiful two-inch baby glass eels are coming into tributaries of the Hudson River estuary. And we use it, uh, and we do this using 800 volunteers that are high school students, college interns, watershed groups, families, retirees, whomever. Anybody can get out and go eeling. Next slide. Here's how it works. At about a dozen sites between New York City and Albany, we establish, we stake these cone-shaped nets in the mouths of streams where they meet the Hudson River. Every day for about eight weeks, a small team of volunteers will go out, open the net, remove the baby eels, count them, take some water condition measurements, and then release the eels, not at the site where they were caught, but upstream of the nearest dam or other barrier to migration. So not only are we getting a count of how many baby eels are coming in from the ocean, we're also giving these baby eels a fin up in their journey. They're trying to go upstream, but sadly, dams and culverts can stop them, so we're trying to help them out. There's a little, there's a little restoration element to that as well. 
The techniques that we use have been established by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And in fact, every state from Maine down to Florida has got some sort of eel census site like this. It's just that with ours, we're using trained volunteers to do the counting. Next slide. Now, of course, in any citizen science project, one of the big questions is, hey, how do you know that the information you're collecting is, is, is robust, is worth, is worth having? And there's a lot of things about this project that make it really, really unique. The gear is very specialized. These nets at this time of year and the way they're set, they only catch small eels. Um, so there's not a lot of fish identification. You, if, you're, if you've got a fish, it's going to be an eel. If it doesn't look like an eel, you're going to know it. The protocols are very straightforward. We're not asking for tremendously detailed information on individual eels. We're trying to get numbers. We're trying to get a presence, absence, a magnitude, things that are straightforward, not simple, but clear. We have a lot of great graphic guides and data sheets that will walk the volunteers through what they have to do and what they have to look for. And communication is key. We have ongoing training. We have our first orientation next week at the end of, end of January. We start up and then throughout the season, which is really from mid-March to mid-May, we've got constant emails. We're always out in the fields, on-site trainings, keeping volunteers engaged and happy and informed and skillful. Next slide. So if you go onto our website, by the way, Hudson River Eel Project, you can, you can get as much data as your heart likes. This is just the one data slide I'll put up for, for this presentation, which is to show is that if you look at our average eels caught per day across all our sites, we're seeing that in the last 10 years, there has been a bumpy, but still evident rise in eels that are coming into our Hudson River estuary. And lo and behold, this is repeated in a lot of sites along the East Coast. So although eels still remain a depleted species, some sites, including the Hudson River, are showing some hopeful signs that maybe eels are on a little bit of a comeback or at least a little bit of a stabilizing trend. So that's great on the eel end, on the data end, in addition to the sort of scientific goals of this project, we've also got the education and the social ends of this uh, goals of this project. Next slide. It turns out eels are awesome for citizen science. They're very charismatic. I know what you're thinking. Slimy eels, they're gross. No, you hold a baby eel in the palm of your hand, you see its little heart beating, its little gills fluttering, suddenly you are transported into another world and you love your stream. And that stream can be anywhere. It can be an urban creek going through parking lots and, and, and housing developments. It can be a rural creek with beautiful farms and forests. Eels don't discriminate, they are ubiquitous and everywhere, which means anybody can participate in their own neighborhood. You're very likely to see eels. When they're migrating, they're in those streams. Even if you don't know it, the stream near you, if you're on the East Coast, it's got eels, I guarantee it. Diversity of habitats equals diversity of audiences. All right, next slide. If you do decide to go after a project like this though, I wanna give one really strong piece of advice, something that we've learned both from our impressions, but also from surveys and interviewing our volunteers. In terms of recruiting citizen science volunteers, internal motivators matter more than external ones. Now that may seem to be like a no duh kind of sentence, but the truth here is that most of our volunteers, when we ask them, why do you do this year after year? They cite things like, it's fun. I get to be outside with my friends. I like it. It's not so much about saving the world or saving the eels or getting extra credits. Those are important, but they're secondary to the personal connections that people feel with each other and with themselves when they're in nature. So use that as a tool for recruiting your volunteers. And if you're lucky, some of those volunteers might go on. Next slide. Some of those volunteers might go on to build environmental careers of their own. 
I'm so happy about these three people. I hope they're listening because uh, these are three examples of students who worked with us in high school, who went on to college, who went on to, 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 to build environmental careers of their own. And we're so glad that they, that they blessed our project with their expertise and with their enthusiasm. And it's all part of these, this stepping stone, this ladder of stewardship that we wanna get people involved in. Okay, wrap up thoughts on the next slide. You can, you can sort of read this next slide for your own. Students and volunteers do collect valid data. The, the, the entry bar is low. You don't need a ton of expertise, but the skills and the experiences you gain is really, really high. And any citizen science program can be a huge, vital, crucial step to building our next generation of conservation leaders, but also in bridging the different generations together, people working together. And my very last slide, Next, please. In case you want it, you can steal this. This is a song. This eel is your eel to be sung to the tune of this land is your land. Always a hit. Get out there. Get wet. Catch some eels. And if you're not in the Hudson River Valley, then start an eel project or another fishery conservation project of your own. Thank you very much. Chris Bowser, there's my email address. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Chris. And I'd like to say a thank you to all of our speakers today for sharing their stories and their programs with us. And with that, we're just going to have a few concluding slides here. As all of our speakers have touched on is this concept of data quality. Can you use citizen science towards you know, NOAA science projects? And I'd like to reflect a quote from a 2016 public publication, which states, each citizen science data set, set should be judged individually according to project design and application, rather than assumed to be substandard simply because volunteers generated it. And I'll echo what here EPA did in 2019 after years of research. They came out with what was called a handbook on quality assurance and documentation with 19 strategies and templates to ensure appropriate to ensure data quality depending on the objective that you had. They have templates in there and it's available online for anybody who might want to take a look at it. I'll also add for a recent presentation I gave to our Earth Sciences Information Partners winter meeting, there was the question of data quality. Always can we trust the power of the crowd? So to try to answer this question, I took a deep dive into seven programs at NOAA, citizen science programs, ranging from classifying cyclones to the Hudson River Eel Project, so even our cooperative observer program, weather uh, mag um, magnetic data, even stellar, our charismatic megafauna, stellar sea lions, and even some shark programs. And try to see how did they, what were their methods for data quality and were there any unifying themes? And some four themes emerged. Keep it simple was one of the unifying ones. If you look at Chris Bowser's Hudson River Eel Project, when volunteers go into the field, when they're using those nets, those nets can only really collect a very small, different, few, only a few different types of organisms. So volunteers aren't asked to you know, look through 20 different organisms and say, is this an eel or what life stage is it? Or if somebody's classifying an image online, if they just have to say, is a sea lion present versus trying to measure it, identify it among 10 other organisms, the simpler it is, the, easy, the better your chances of getting higher quality data. Also, don't underestimate the value of metadata. As we get more extremes in weather and you're looking at automated checks to see is something you know, above a, you know, a threshold, well, that may, that may get harder as we go on. So for example, if, if in the metadata, in the notes of that observer, just like you saw with the, I think the Mount St. Helens eruption, um, this is the most hail I ever saw. This is the most rain I ever saw. It can help ground truth that data point. Also, paired manual and automated checks kind of go, can go hand in hand to help with your data quality. For some of those weather programs upon the data entry phase, there are checks in there. There are checks that, you know, MCEI will run. For example, you know, again, is this a, a, an extreme? Is this 100 inches of rain, which would be above very various thresholds? So the automated checks can serve their purpose, but the manual ones will also ca catch data errors that you may not always catch. And what was also interesting in learning and talking to these programs is that most errors recorded are, are recording errors. They're not measurement errors. So it goes to the, the importance of paired manual and automated checks. And finally, the increasing overlap we're seeing between AI or machine learning and citizen science. 
you know, just like we heard, I think in um, one of the programs, I just wrote a note down that was, oh yeah, in old weather, could those read the logs in the old weather? You know, could that machine learning do that? You know, you've got these citizen scientists transcribing the data. Could they help, could that the effort, the data they're producing help train this machine learning models? You know, could it work collaboratively with machine learning? Could machine learning also be used to help data quality efforts? For example, go scouring all the comments, you know, things like this is the most hail I ever saw and adding to the data quality project. But so just, you know, observing that there's increasing overlap between those things, I think is was a learning experience for me. And then the final wrap up again, what were the recommendations for those wanting to initiate citizen science projects, but have high quality data, keep it simple. Pilot test early was another one for those online models where somebody had to go online and say classify a cyclone. What they did was they tried to figure out how many online participants do we have to have classify an image, you know, and how and agree before we can use that data point. So they started out with 30, but later found out they only needed 10. So you're basically wasting your clicks at that point. So, you know, really pilot test early to maximize the, the data you're gonna get back from your volunteers. And again, some of the similar lessons combine manual and automated checks. And also understand mistakes are gonna happen, but the value in some of our program, our citizen science programs, volunteers don't mind being contacted with questions. They're not gonna take an offense. Oh, you're questioning my data. And instead, it's a teachable moment to say, hey, here's, here's what's going on and we're using your data. And also, at the end of the day, ask yourself if citizen science is the best approach, exclusively, maybe complementary, or is something else better? That's a question, you know, citizen science, even though you've got the volunteer aspect, you know, there is an investment of time and resources. So asking whether, you know, where it fits or how it fits is always a valuable question. And with that, I'm just gonna have a reminder that if you are in NOAA and you wanna join our community of practice, please reach out to John or myself. And also for anybody looking to volunteer with the project, we've got a website here and this, this uh, presentation will be available online to get all these links. And with that, I'm gonna open it up to questions. Okay, thank you, John and Laura, for that excellent presentation. Um, I will say we have a big online audience, so if you're online and submitted questions, um, some of them we may have to forward to the presenters uh, just so you can get your answers. But um, we can start with questions in the room, and then Laura, if you'd like to run the microphone, then you can retain ownership sure. <laughs> of that. That's great. Yep. Thanks. Is there a particular demographic of who is a citizen scientist? So if you were starting a program and you were able to focus some energy on getting some people to help with that program, is it mostly K through 12s or retired people or that kind of thing, or 4-H clubs? No, that, that's a great question. And I, I, I think I'm gonna to turn to my colleague here who I think has a... And it varies by program. Uh, sorry, I have to lie, so. um, Yeah, it varies by program. That's a great question. And uh, some programs, even though they are not targeting a specific audience, that's who they tend to attract. Um, we, uh, I think Amy mentioned the Coco Raz network when she's talking about rain gauges. And that's a network of uh, 20,000 people um, across the country who actively monitor precipitation. And their viewer, their um, volunteers tend to skew retiree age and they tend to skew more rural. And when they have done some analysis, there was not a lot of diversity in their participants. Um, so finding ways uh, to target audiences that are appropriate for your project. Um, in general, this is not a hard and fast rule. Targeting schools can be very impactful with regard to learning, but it's often a more difficult bar to keep the schools involved um, than it is to attract a volunteer or some, uh, some, somebody who may be a retiree. Um, but when you look at some of the projects, the online projects that are coming online more often, um, it's a different, uh, volunteer base than some of our hands-on projects, and it is extremely diverse. And some of these projects have people of all ages. Um, some some projects have 14-year-olds who are getting public, public publications out of citizen science, um, and they have uh, people in uh, well into the retirement years who are uh, significant contributors. Um, so with regard to the online projects, and especially some of the ones that have a gaming uh, tool, it can really uh, be a very different answer than the 
hands-on project that requires going outside every day. Any problems with uh, Paperwork Reduction Act or liability if I get bit while tagging a shark? Yeah, th those are serious concerns. Oh, do you want to go? Oh, no, go ahead. Those are serious considerations. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that, that's that's some of the toughest questions. Um, and uh, definitely talking to uh, your general counsel and trying to figure out what the liability issues are for a given project and the Paperwork Reduction Act. Um, there was some hope that the Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Act of 2017 would give a blanket um, clearance for citizen science projects not to go through PRA. That did not come through. So we don't we don't have that. Um, so each project kind of has to be evaluated on a case by case basis of what questions it's asking and if if it has Paperwork Reduction Act uh, considerations. Um, on CitizenScience.gov, that website for federal citizen science I mentioned, um, there's a toolkit, and part of the toolkit is legal implications. Um, and there's some um, some lawyers from uh, multiple agencies who work in crowdsourcing and citizen science have offered some, I think, helpful thoughts there. But yeah, when you create a project, especially in the federal government, that's serious consideration. So you touched on gamification. Yeah. Uh, are there any good examples of gamification in NOAA? Yeah. Great question. Um, there probably are. And I'm trying to think of. None are coming to mind for me right off the top of yeah. my, uh, my head. And apologies if I'm not thinking of anyone right now. Um, probably describe yep. I don't know if anybody yeah understands. great question within the federal government there are some great examples and a lot of them are in the human health world uh, the National Institute of Health actually has a point person who runs funding opportunities for people to create uh, basically online programs that are games that result in very useful data um, and one of them is protein folding so figuring out ways that you can fold a protein it turns out the human brain is actually great at pattern recognition and creative solutions. Um, so they've actually put out a game where you're folding a protein without, it's called Fold It, and you're folding a protein without even real, necessarily realizing you're folding a protein, more you're playing this game. Um, and they've gotten new and useful solutions to how to fold proteins from that. Um, and there are other ones like chromosome matching where you're sliding red and blue dots and you may not even realize necessarily that you're doing, um, uh, um, Citizen science, but you you, have to, you are you're you're helping out with crowdsourcing. and you're helping create uh, matching of uh, species chromosomes while basically playing an online game. Yeah, great question. Any other questions in the room? Okay. Okay, so we can go to our online questions now, and I'm just going to. Um, unmute our panelists so that they can respond because we have a lot of program specific questions so okay can I so respond now respond to the gamification question yes go ahead so in old weather uh, your rank on keying a ship was determined by how many observations you had keyed and so people would work quite hard. They would stay with the ship for one thing, even when their ship got boring and was just in port. And the most interesting thing happening was painting the ship. They would, they would complain on the forum that their ship was boring, but they were very loyal to it. And they were very um, sometimes aggressive in trying to increase their rank and become the captain of the ship. So that was a different way to gamify. You were in charge based on your progress and contribution to the project on a ship-by-ship -ship basis. Okay, very interesting. Um, and so the first online question that we have is, how is NOAA citing citizen science and peer-reviewed publications? So in old weather, we acknowledge old weather. So, Actually, that, that was a question that came up at the Earth Science Information Partners meeting. You know, how are we citing citizen science data? Do Are we actually assigning DOIs to citizen science data sets? Um, it, it's actually an area that requ requires further exploration, and I think that's something our federal community of practice is going to have a specific call on about how not just NOAA is doing it, but how other agencies are looking into that and how they're citing citizen science data or a, labeling citizen science data sets. Um, John, is there anything you would? Yeah, no, some projects are have policies of citing all the citizen science volunteers in all their publications. Um, but we have programs at NOAA where it's anonymous. 
So as Laura, you saw on Laura's slides, the ones that have known volunteers and ones that have unknown volunteers. Um, so in some cases, we could cite volunteers by name, um, but in some cases, they're completely anonymous and we don't have a way of sending them. We could cite the, the program. So I think this is something we're still working through. And again, like a lot with citizen science, it's going to be a project by project answer. I think we can have general guidelines, but um, there may not be a universal policy that works for everybody. Okay, so another question that we had is, how are these programs being paid for? Is it through NOAA or other funding? Sure. Um, so we at NOAA have, don't have a dedicated NOAA-wide funding source for citizen science. So Laura and I are co-coordinators, we coordinate. We don't have a funding pot for projects. Um, they're kind of more grassroots funded at the, uh, uh, the line office or the field office level. Um, most of our projects are done in partnership, and that was true across the federal government as well. When the Fort Congress came out, um, one of the facts it highlighted was almost all projects run by the federal government are not run in-house by just one agency. They uh, par partner with other agencies and with individual groups, and um, quite a few of ours are done through grant funding and through cooperative agreements. Um, and I think on some of the slides here today, you saw some of the uh, partner names. I'm not going to speak for the presenters because I think you saw it, but um, yeah, they're, they're very seldomly done in-house by one agency. Great, and did any of the panelists have anything else to add to that? So I work for um, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, as well as the, uh, the research reserve for the Hudson River. And we have some of our funding comes through, to support us, comes through through our normal budget. But again, the partnership leverage thing is terrific in the sense that a lot of people sign on to these projects because they want to. So you've got that sort of sweat equity and, and time equity that people dedicate. And then also some of our partners are nonprofit organizations that do their own fundraising and the value of the citizen science program that they're doing and the, the sort of, the sort of uh, uh, attention it gathers. Is a, is, a, is a fundraising element for them, which I deliberately have nothing to do with, but it's, it's, it, it allows them to go off in creative directions as well. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that we had was somewhat in the same vein. They wanted to know if um, you reimburse volunteers for their expenses or time, and uh, second part of that question, if you recruit volunteers for a specific purpose or to fill a gap. So, so in this old, if I if I may, in I'll let the panelists uh, panelists go ahead first. Okay, great. So this is Amy Fritz. Within our program, we have specific requirements for where observations need to be placed. And so when we have a volunteer who may retire out of the program, then yes, our field personnel at the forecast offices will go out and recruit a new volunteer to hopefully replace them. Ideally, very close proximity to where the other volunteer was located so that we keep the climate record going. But it, sometimes it's not always possible, especially in the real rural communities, and they'll recruit a new volunteer where they may not be quite so close, so it's considered a new station. Any of the other panelists wish to comment on here on this? So we'll yes. have specific campaigns for uh, ships that are, say, a focus for an extreme event, or ships that are in a particular place, like that went to the Arctic to support the Blue Economy Initiative. And so this is Jennifer Jenks. Um, so we actually partner with the University of New Hampshire who sent out a survey uh, to the crowdsourcing community to actually see like what, what are the incentives that you're looking for to participate? Do you want a sticker? Do you want money? Do you want a pat on the back? And overwhelmingly they came back with, we want data. That's what they want. They, they want to be able to participate in this and they want to be able to access all of the newly collected data. That, that was really the bottom line. Um, and as far as concentrating effort, as I showed in the map, we just basically need data everywhere. Um, but a lot of these trusted nodes, these organizations are absolutely focusing on areas where data is scarce. Um, there's a Canadian program up in the Arctic that's actually um, using the indigenous community up there and providing them with data loggers as well and training them to go out and start collecting data. Um, so a lot of the focus is really where there just isn't any data at all. Um, I'll also add to that, if, if somebody is using the Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Act as the authority under which their project is conducted, there are explicit guidelines or under, over 
whether how a volunteer is defined. And I think in there it says the volunteers cannot be compensated for their their time or efforts. I you know maybe there may be a fine line, for example, if somebody is you know taking their ship and whether their fuel costs are covered, that may may or may not be considered compensation. But there are pretty clear guidelines in the act on that point. And with regard to equipment, it's sometimes impressive um, what people are willing to do. Like the Kokoraz network, which I mentioned, rain gauge volunteers, 20,000 active volunteers a day. People purchase their own, most, the vast majority of those volunteers have purchased their own rain gauge for about 35 US dollars um, to be able to collect data. So um, it, it is impressive for what, what people's motivation will, motivations will be. Okay, so that is all the time that we have today. Thank you again, everyone, so much for joining us. We do have lots more program-specific questions, so presenters, you'll receive a list of those. So, uh, be on the lookout for that. Um, and thank you to the panelists and Laura and John. Thanks, everybody. So, thank, thank you very much. Thank you.